Hello everyone, today we talk about the ancient Germanic religion in a broader Indo-European perspective, but also one of the topics that we normally discuss, um, starting for example from the uh, Romano-Germanic perspective and even, you know, as a mostly medieval history-based channel, what this, this um, uh, encounter fundamentally meant in the history of Western uh, civilization. We are going to make videos actually about the religions of all the Indo-European peoples. We already talked a lot about the Romans, not ever sp specifically much uh, about the Germanic uh, spiritual dimension. And um, and this aspect is important because we have interpreted history uh, definitely through the moral revival of some some force that was considered, in fact, at the core of these universal religions as the real um, divine power that could be in, in some way earned and uh, disposed of by some individuals of most in fact supernatural uh, character that were so in virtue of um, in fact primarily of their virtue right and the thing actually in the European terms and also in other religions frankly goes beyond to the actual the descendants of um, these individuals, noblemen and heroes, and this is quite marked in Germanic uh, religion. In fact, we will see also in other videos that I want to make about this topic how meaningful this was to an actual biological connection, right? But the, the thing here is complex, we should talk about it also for the other religions because they all seem to, to hint back at a common uh, root in this. Um, what mostly interests us is explaining how the same um, Germanic, Roman, Ghibelline uh, force idea was revived by these stocks of peoples of northern origin, um, which uh, cer certain migratory processes had, as you know, pushed in the area of Roman civilization, the Mediterranean, broadly speaking. And in this sense, overlapping with those, um, you know, with those pre-existing uh, migrations that had made, in fact, the same Hellenic, the Roman civilization from the north and so on. So, um, this is all the more relevant if we consider that with the traslatio and renovatio imperi, the Germans were destined essentially to defend properly the imperial idea uh, against those forces that were trying to curb its uh, its force, uh, its universal power. Um, this is true in a, in a broader sense, as we will see in the same Germanic religion as well as in others, but specifically in this one, feels the sense of impending doom, right? The idea that the world ages, but that this thing is, you know, quite uh, closer than, than we think, generally speaking. The, uh, the Greeks and the Romans had... Uh, probably because they belong to some stocks that were the most powerful as they had come to rule in the Mediterranean. Um, let's say a, a more mm, Apollonian or crystallized idea of supreme power. Right? This is especially true in for the Hellenic um, religion, the, Ar the archaic one. For Rome, literally, they, they achieved that, right? Repristinating the, the Golden Age uh, under... Um, Augustus, as you will see, the Germans have a much more gloomy and, and dark and almost, uh, in fact, tragic idea of the destiny of the world. That is the one, again, that all these um, religions actually shared, but again, in, in the German case, was Germanic case was felt as kind of more intensely and more, um, even subconsciously at a certain level. Um, so, what we see in definitely, also in the Germanic uh, Gibbelinism, and I just made a video a couple of days ago about Guelphs, Ghibellines, etc. Also the relation with the church, we'll have to come back to on that because, as you know, there is an important contrast of who detained properly the imperium uh, in authority the terms and uh, the uh, the militia, the the chivalry was considered in the Indo-European terms to be properly a priestly class, which uh, the church in this sense was, and, and it's also as a secular power the church was opposed to um, in a way and that that uh, showed some kind of struggle uh, on properly the interpretation of within 
um, the feudal civilization that however indeed arose from the renewal of power of the same uh, ancient formative plasmating bis of the ancient Roman world um, because of these peoples that regenerated a force in areas by the way where historically this ha had not been present because you know no empire great civilization had occurred in in central Europe um, and that instead as you know as we've seen also in medieval history very often you know it was molded properly in a continental sense right especially the post Carolingian world that, that was the one of the empire had revived first and eventually the in fact the Ottonians in the same uh, Eastern Germanic Kingdom from the within of these countries managed to um, recompact a system that went beyond it that we kind of re we recognize in fact it, especially in a post Carolingian sense it's properly the hardcore of, of, of westernness that that you know was more readily evident before let's say the modern contemporary times where other mechanisms uh, occurred and other, actually also other powers emerged in a sense but from very different premises than the traditional uh, one so this aspect uh, should not be underestimated the Germanic capacity to reinvigorate that universal imperial force of divine origin so um, as far as the Germans were concerned well since the times of Tacitus they appeared uh, as a broader fascist to be very similar to the Achaean the Paleo-Iranian the Paleo-Roman and other northern uh, Indo-European stocks that um, had been preserved uh, in culturally by a certain measure also ethnically um, from in this state of primitive uh, literally prehistoric if we talk about Augustan times um, uh, nature that was in fact very appreciated even by a, what was at that point uh, a very advanced civilization like the Roman one as you know the Romans were very uh, they, they admired deeply for in fact this um, older traditional religious reasons the nature of the Germans right it's not just a matter of you know uh, the trope of the good savage it's literally the fact that the Romans recognized within the Germanic culture a lot of elements that were belonging to the to the common primitive origin of the Indo-European people that had made that same kind of Roman uh, religious and military triumph over over the world and in in a in a um, uh, meaning also that the Germans at that point had been some of the few peoples that had managed to pose the same Romans and preserving this this kind of uh, older customs so we're talking about uh, Germanic populations eventually coalized as you, we've seen very often during the migration era um, uh, just like the Goths the Longobards the Burgundians the Franks etc that um, you know we're, we're looked upon in, a, in uh, at least in a modernistic and uh, secularistic sense as a sort of uh, merely barbarian that is properly lesser element uh, in a sense and that instead were actually recognized by the same Roman uh, civilization even in, uh, in the time of its decadence um, to uh, to embody in fact some greater forms of tradition and even in the, the those same coarse and unsophisticated forms um, of the Germanic customs that however retained uh, impressive principles of honor faithfulness and pride were still fundamentally at the root yeah you know, at the time of Roman civilization but that had been uh, in fact decaying and degenerating especially the elites uh, being ever more kind of uh, hedonistic in nature right urbanized with this massive um, juridical administration that still however needed these barbarians as a matter of fact to fight ever in larger numbers uh, so intellectualism aestheticism this cosmopolitan idea of the empire was actually um, showing how actually far from the older 
uh, archaic Roman archaic principle as well. This is especially true um, in the eastern half of the empire, whereas, as we have seen just recently, the western half would effectively be the one that the Latin Germanic culture altogether uh, would go on paradoxically to towards uh, you know a higher a higher destiny compared to to the other area. Um, so it's exactly this, in fact, barbaric element that is to be understood in a, even in there, in, in a religious military sense as a meaning, not the barbarian in the, again, progressist, technologistic way we intend today, but literally the tonic force, uh, you know, uh, unregulated forces that the, all the, the Uranian pantheon of all the Indo Indo European peoples had crushed to establish the order, right? So. Uh, it's also very meaningful, in fact, that uh, properly a Romano-Germanic um, culture arose from this because it was, in a sense, the elevation of the Germans to a certain status and the Roman lowering at the, uh, at the same time so that they kind of met at a point and kind of shared also these um, principles, right? Uh, bringing them back in, in by some, some measure in, in absolute terms. And... Um, the Germanic archaic religion is uh, it's a bit complex to look at because telling the truth is one of, of the most, um, let's say, um, transformed from the origins. There is all a problem, you know, that even the same Germanic languages, we, we don't understand actually where, whether we're Cantum or Satum or a mix of both. Uh, we find uh, a substantial element, up to 30% of pre-Indo-European element in there, um, so that we see that if you consider the wave of uh, conquerors uh, that uh, swarmed to Europe in the various regions, that indeed the northern parts were the, uh, the, la the least appealing, and therefore the ones where the Indo-European element was less marked in a sense. And this probably explains why the uh, Germanic religion is also so uh, prominently displaying uh, a, a greater force of the canonic element of the uh, of the giants of the dwarves etc so uh, a titanic element that was not curbed as strongly as in the other in the european religions because it probably symbolized the uh, the pre indo european element that had remained uh, you know uh, a threat to the establishment of of the conquerors um in a sense and also a problem that we have with the germanic religion is that it came to us in a in a form that, aside from this uh, primigenial mix, in a sense, uh, was rather fra fragmentary, uh, often altered uh, with unrefined residues. Let's say that, uh, however, do still display this deep inner legacy uh, of you know the the the, the Weltanschauung from which the heroic uh, cycles of Indo-European religions uh, derive. Um, part of this uh, occurred because uh, the uh, also more time passed, generally speaking, from the origins, so that even when we read the sagas, rather than spotting the, the, the Christianizing element, we are actually talking about um, uh, properly stories that within the same Germanic world had somewhat um, degenerated, right? That there were, there were sp secondary spurious elements kind of obscuring the myth in the saga by, all by itself and so this complicates a bit the story. In fact, we will see there are some contradictions or at least superimpositions of Apollonian and Ectonic element that do not add up, right? And that uh, unlike you know, other, uh, other Indo-European religions. In any case, um, what we see in the myth of the Ed, that it, as you know, contains basically the the core of the Germanic religion in this form, um, different forms, right? Brose in, in poetry and in prose, etc., with different elements. Sometimes we have just one one reference to a specific uh, place or element or character. So we have to naturally study this carefully with some background. Also, it's obvious that the Indo-European pattern cannot be fully read if not in a comparative way with the other Indo-European um, religions, like it's basically useless to study Germanic or Roman 
uh, or or Vedic religion if you don't study them all together because basically you, you would lose great part of, of their meaning uh, otherwise that was in fact the, the same um, at the end of the day um, and the myth of the Edda shows the impending doom right this is a permanent condition um, and the of course the heroic will opposed to it and in older parts of the myth remains the memory of uh, a, a deep freeze, right? That is this moment of um, obscuration, literally, uh, that arrested, in, the, in fact, in the myth, the 12 streams originating from the primordial and luminous center of Muspelheim, uh, located, uh, quote, at the far end of the earth, so uh, embodying that center uh, of the world corresponding to what is the Ar Ariana Beg, right, uh, in the Iranian uh, tradition that is essentially the Hyperborean seat, right, from which the gods literally ruled and that, um, you know, from which eventually from this series of calamities um, uh, the uh, the world began to, to decline from some kind of important break and, and fall um, and um, this the, the Muspelheim would uh, equate to the radiant northern island of the Indus river uh, and other figurations of the seat of, of the golden age um, and as we were saying before it, the the same example of the Muspelheim now that I think about it is, is a good one to explain the uh, controversial interpretation of the Edda tradition, per se, because, for example, we find the in, in in the Edda the Muspelheim, so the the world of fire, actually no longer located in the north, where in all Indo-European religions was actually fixed there, um, corresponded to the Nordic hyperboreal seat, um, where the light reigned supreme, while the Niflheim and the frost giants that inhabited actually were right so the north actually comes m to be controlled in part by these uh chthonic forces which is quite disturbing kind of in any european perspective um while the Muspelheim was invaded by the forces of the south so this broader south intended as also still the chthonic element as well with that lived in fact both in the Niflheim and, and the Muspelheim that um quickly the latter which quickly thus turned unto, uh, into its opposite, right? acquiring actually a negative value. In fact, um, the Muspelheim would, uh, would become the seat of the Surtur, a fire demon, uh, not the one of sacred fire um, of the Indo-Europeans, who will actually overcome the gods and usher in the end of the cycle, as you know, with the twilight, uh, twilight of, the, of the gods, as we'll see now. Um, so, in a way, the children of Muspelheim would become the enemies of the Uranian gods of the Azer, the Azen, uh, so much that they, they will also cause the Bifrost Bridge, that is the one that unites heaven and earth, to collapse once they, they, they will ride over it. We know this from the Voluspa saga, by the way. Interestingly enough, the Edda also mentions a Greenland mm -hmm. floating on the abyss and surrounded by the ocean. That, you know, the broader, and that's what all the background that we have never talked about. It would also include the myth of Atlantis and all the meanings at least that we think um, correspond to it, and etc. You will see it in another time. Well, this Greenland that especially in the case of the Norse, you understand what could be easily uh, corresponding to geographically, uh, would be the actually the original location of the fall. That is, of the dark and tragic times that at some point had eventually broken the Golden Age. Uh, since this was the place where the warm current of the Muspelheim uh, that in, in this order of traditional myths the waters represent the force that gives the life 
to people and to races. This is really evident in many Germanic myths, right? Among the Longbirds, the Franks, they got the, it's always this idea of the of the waters, this kind of um, originally uh, divine kind of source that met actually with the frigid current of the Urgemir, the major spring located on the Niflheim, and actually um, at the uh, being one of the three major springs at the primary roots of the cosmic tree Ig Yggdrasil, where as we will see also the the vast amount of snakes and the dragon Nidhogger um, 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 fundamentally uh, are eroding the same roots uh, of the world and so increasing that sense of impending them. So always they are always quite properly rooted within the same basis of the uh, of the world uh, itself. You understand how dark that is. Now in terms of um, Greenland, well the Greenland could also be Ireland in, in a sense, but the Grunus land, the Greenland um, the idea of green, uh, allegedly, you know, the fact that sin still at the time of Procopius, uh, the 6th century, Greenland retained a lush vegetation, right, and that uh, uh, a freeze would have brought that to, to an end, right, this this is all contained um, in, the, in the myth. Now, just as in the Zen Avesta, the freezing and dark winter that depopulated the Ariana Vago, was conceived as the work of an evil god, as the one of darkness, uh, opposed to the luminous creation. Well, likewise, the Eddic myth may allude to the same alteration that precipitated the the new cycle, um, and this is true, especially uh, if we consider that the myth mentions a generation of giants and other tectonic. Uh, beings that uh, being defrosted literally by the warm current uh, and against whom the race of the Asen is going to fight. So from this encounter two forces of course would start the, the, cosmic, the cosmic fight. So in the Edda the theme of the Ragnarok or Ragnarok so the destiny, the twilight of the gods is connected with such clash, uh, famously enough, which is also the equivalent of the traditional teaching concerning the fourth stage of the involutive process of the world, Orbis Seneshet. So uh, the Ragnarok would be uh, so the threat, the, the struggling world, right, that is already dominated by this dual, um, in fact, struggle, but also thinking. Right. In fact, when we talk about the twilight of the gods, um, and especially in the Germanic tradition, we see um, a, a deep metaphor in it because it's not just the final fight, right? This eschatological perspective, after all, but properly, the, its signification, the dimming of the gods in human consciousness, of course. The cosmic struggle is a metaphor of the individual struggle um, because mankind essentially loses the gods. That is also the possibility of establishing a contact with them. That, considering the modernistic and secularistic path of the world, actually this seems to have been quite the case. Um, and such a destiny naturally may be avoided, however, mm, asymptotically, idealistically, by preserving the purity of the deposit of that primordial and symbolic element that is gold, with which the palace of the heroes, the same Asgard altogether, the all of Odin, um, twelve thrones, was built. And there is naturally a sacred nature connected to gold because this element could act as a source of good health as long as it, it's not touched by any ctonic, but probably also human being. This is particularly important because it stresses the idea that naturally there are some uh, 
individuals who are actually descending from the gods, the nobility, also the heroes that are capable of transfiguring in the way we've seen in the video, for example, on the, um, the European Holy War, creatures that exist as a sort of uh, racial degeneration of the older divine stock. So a gold that can be beneficial only if it's not touched essentially by these elements that are considered to be morally, more than else, inferior and therefore uh, undeserving of the divine substance. And it's very meaningful that in the same Germanic myth, this gold falls actually into the hands of Albericus, who is the king of the chthonic beings that in the different tradition are either the dwarves or the Nibelungs. I mean, the same Nibelungs are actually a dual thing because from one side are either the Burgundians in the um, in, in the tradition and or the properly the dwarves that dwell in this lesser world, the Chthonic sub subterranean one. But even humans um, altogether are basically a, 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 a de degenerated race of, a, among which only some actually as we've seen can connect with the 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 divine and can reach the asgard and the valhalla and that's properly the point that the hero dying taming this chthonic element and transfiguring it itself into the uh which in germanic tradition is actually the yeah the 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 the, the, the heavenly maiden right of of glory the, the valkyrie right that, that eventually brings the soul of just of the elite that had died achieving that feat because otherwise the same Valkyrie would not exist as such we would just be a demon right and, and, the, and the guy would, die, would essentially go as we'll see now in in the in the mouth of the forces of the underworld will be able to reach the Valhalla that is also built in that in that divine um, substance and glory um, so this part of the myth clearly sh uh, the one of the gold of the Nibelungs etc shows the echo of what in other traditions was the advent of the Bronze Age. So this um, phase of the Titanic Promethean Rebellion, thinking about Loki in the same Germanic tradition that steals fire and is damned just like Prometheus, like in the Atlantic myth. And that is how fundamentally the, the myth explains the capacity that mankind has acquired also to deal with something very dangerous, some power that uh, could easily go out of their hand. I mean, think just about nuclear power and this atrocious uh, power that we have acquired by not essentially deserving them morally as individuals because we have the hate and somebody has basically stolen that secret and that power um, from the gods, uh, given it to us in an undeserving way. In fact, Loki gets, uh, you know, punished quite atrociously, just like Prometheus, as a consequence. Um, and devoured by a snake, so even uh, always here, the, the chthonic element that is naturally in all the Indo-European traditions kind of dominated by this, the Uranian superiority of the Olympian gods, right? So that Odin properly sends the snake and, you know, Odin is surrounded all by chthonic elfing about the crow, the wolf, etc. And that that's all the metaphor for of course the idea of the senior and the, his kind of um masnata and so the idea that the, the lesser element has to transfigure through this uh, heroic deeds in in war so that only then it can elevate himself right to this kind of almost ritual that in fact the same odin acquires that wisdom that is the same furor actually as the romans would call him that is actually the true um understanding of of reality true reward that the deity achieves by hanging himself by the way so dying um, ritually um, and this uh, titanic promethean rebellion naturally is part of it's a phase of the decadence right so that it uh, there's there is in, in all these religions the golden age the silver age then the bronze age and the iron age right and so uh, we would be living in the latter and the, the Bronze Age would have been started by this rebellion from 
from the masses from the of these obscure elements that would actually be the same humans that were were provided with this technological power by the by the same gods right or at least the part of their degenerated ones as you know loki is actually connected to odin in the same in the same religion also this is how humans or dwarves depending again on the complications of the tradition that we can't properly districate at some point that the nibelungs whoever they where you conceive them like and the giants at the same time and the dwarves were represented as the creators of magical objects and weapons that um, will change hands and be acquired by the same Azen, so the same gods and, and, and the heroes, right? F f think, for example, of the Hammer Thunderbolt of Thor that is created in a competition, if I'm not wrong, between Loki and the, this other dwarf and, and a dwarf that, uh, you know, wanted to create the best weapon for, for the gods, right? Which, you know, the Hammer of Thor actually corresponds to the Divaria of of uh, Urtra in the Vedic religion is, is exactly the same thing. Is it's the thunderbolt in of Jupiter, and of Zeus, and it, it's the same meaning, um, and a solar symbol at the same time. Even the swastika naturally is that the symbol that in, in um, among the Anglo-Saxons and the Norse w was properly uh, connected to Thor's hammer, but also the golden ring um, and the magical helmet of Sigurd slash Siegfried that are connected. In fact, the golden ring is connected to the curse of the gold that the dwarves have controlled so much that it's also the tragic destiny of the of, of the hero, uh, Sigurd, that, as you know, in the story doesn't end well so much that, I mean, it, it will not end well for the gods. So why, how could it <laughs> ever end well for heroes or even as for, for, for men, right? And so this element, also the trick the the uh, deception etc is always present uh, by standard you know in all the uh, um, all the Germanic sagas and um, and the the results in the Gilfagen make uh, a rather complex explanation of how such weapons and other objects were turning actually into um, let's say liabilities to the Asen when they employed the uh, uh, Nibelungs and the, the same tools in the reconstruction of the Asgard fortress, which, as we have seen, was built in in a in an element that didn't have to be connected in any way to the uh, to the ketonic beings that instead, paradoxically, is rebuilt also by the tools that these had built. So adding to this kind of presentment of the of the disaster of the doom of the end because the the spell is involved broken and or it's always a tangential kind of asymptotic direction you may never know who will win in the end but you always have to stay very sharp because the premonitions are not definitely not good and the fight will happen so this this actually fits pretty well um uh, such a politically and socially unstable world like the Saint Germanic one was, right? And so reinforced the need of boosting that moral force to keep things um, together. Um, so naturally, in a more classical sense, uh, ag over and against this darker world stands the one of the Aesir, the Asen, so these Norse Germanic deities, who embodied the Uranian Apollonian principle in its primigenial warrior aspect. So the god Donar Thor, who slayed uh, Thym and uh, Hymir, that is uh, the, the, the titanic elements, uh, proving the affirmation of the uh, of the Olympic element over the Ketonic uh, primitive forces of the pre-Indo-European world, um, Donner is the strongest of all, the irresistible, the lord who rescues from terror, who is also provided with this fearful weapon, the double hammer Mjolnir, 
uh, that is uh, a variation of the symbolic Indo-European battle axe is found in fact again in all Indo-European uh, cultures the symbol of the thunderbolt force proper of the Uranian gods of the Indo-European side now that there is the most important of all the gods Voden Odin he is the one who grants victory because as we've explained before he has the wisdom Thor is the young warrior in many ways and so it's his physical force his power in, in, in a properly in a physical sense too, that strikes uh, hard but wisdom is superior always to it this is the same you know uh, acknowledgement you find again in, in the um, unvariable superiority of Athena over Ares right and um, and it is true that in the Germanic religion Odin is much more central in many ways that uh, especially in the earlier um, period when we talk about this gods we're not really thinking about gods quite necessarily outlined or defined myths. there are presences forces that um, are also deeply intertwined with each other right by blood eventually in the more articulated sagas but fundamentally Odin is the the spring of all the force in fact he is master the very powerful formulae that are also at the origin of the foot arc um, uh, system that are not to be revealed by the way to any woman because the archetypically the, fem the, the feminine element is connected to the tonic masses of the pre-Indo-Europeans and so this can never be granted to, to a woman um, really not even if she is the king's daughter and the Valkyries are something very different that as we've seen in body actually the alter ego of the same of the same heroes uh, so something very different um, Vodan also was the eagle right it's act utterly disgusting how neo-paganism that of course has nothing to do with by any stretch of the imagination with any kind of historical um, or religious traditional reality uh, represents now the, the crowd the thing but the actual symbol of Vodan was the eagle right the eagle was central in every single kind of Indo-European religion is the base of all it it's the same the, the Romans and the Germans shared actually the same symbol so did the Slavs so did the Henny and um, and and Volan was also naturally the host and the father uh, of the dead heroes who were selected by the Valkyries on the battlefields because it was believed at that point that the divide connections and what uh, became uh, evident at that point that the, the descendants in, in itself by by the same achievement right and uh, according to the original Norse Germanic view the only people to enjoy divine immortality were in fact the heroes chosen by the Valkyries for having managed to actually tame the same and that would be the same expression of, of the redempted soul of the ketonic elements that does live within every man then the nobleman the Adlan that Mm, say by virtue of non-human origin and this was problematic at some level among the Germanic peoples by some degree but it was still somewhat accepted um, in fact generally speaking and this could take different forms uh, even among the uh, Germans as among the italics etc uh, only heroes and nobles were cremated because those were the only ones who were to revert to heaven whereas the others were belonging to the ectonic masses that had been conquered by the Indo-Europeans and so they would have more pertaining to this agrarian uh, uh, sedentary mentality for which naturally the, uh, the the dead would be swallowed by this ectonic uh, inferical deities and, and just get you know and disappear within them so the cremation was connected with whom detained the imperium as a matter as a matter of fact and in the Norse tradition only this ritual prescribed by Odin himself in fact opened the gates of 
the Valhalla. Uh, those who were buried in the Pelasgian background would instead become simp were the slaves of the earth and something else that did not belong to the Uranian element. Um, Woden was also he who bestowed on the noble ones that quote spirit that lives on and which does not die when the body is dissolved in the earth, according to the Gilfa Ginning. Mm -hmm. And and it's as if say the the divine stock was connected uh, to to Woden exclusively, so dating back you know your origins in Werner it was all stemmed from from Woden. Um, and it's important to stress how Vodanism was actually a continental thing, obviously, right? Vodanism spread, uh, let's say, from from Germany to Scandinavia, and uh, because simply because Central Europe was the area from which the Indo-Europeans had, uh, you know, uh, arrived to Scan for, to reach Scandinavia, and were actually the reality was much more militarized than Scandinavia itself. Right, so it was you know Indo-Europeans took over the entire region, but you know eventually Vodanism was nurtured uh, prevalently in the continental part. Um, then there is also there are different hypotheses and you know uh, of the same old and think about the older. We talked about this in the Indo-European Sacred Fury video. There are other similar deities, for example, God Tyr Tutes. Right, it's not Thor, but it's quite similar. It's a yet another god of battles, uh, also the god of the day, of the radiant solar sky, so much that he's represented by the rune of Tivats, that actually in the symbol is more similar to the uh, one of Algets, right, of this kind of Ypsilon, which symbolizes the um, cosmic man rising his hands towards the sky. As all the Indo-European language and meaning and uh, this uh, calling of the uh, of divine power stemmed from the connection with the sky, with the astronomical uh, inquiry. Now, among the various motives of the heroic cycles in the Germanic religion, um, much is connected to the Volsungen Saga, which um, talks about the stock generated between the union of a god with a woman and so uh, bearing uh, existentially this uh, this stigma say in uh, as we all do practically uh, unless we are able to to surpass this kind of instinctive lower tonic element I right, say that that permeates in us now Sigmund is the hero um, will one day extract this sword inserted in the divine tree uh, and uh, he came in fact from the Volsungen and in the saga also uh, Sigurd slash Siegfried after taking possession of the gold that had fallen into the hands of the Nibelungs kills the dragon Fafnir which is another form of the serpent Nidhogg that lives at the roots of as we've seen of the same Yggdrasil and that uh, is to be slain in order to uh, recover the same golden purity. Naturally Sigurd makes uh, a tragic end himself because he can't really escape. There is always uh, a curse in fact connected to the same gold as it was touched by, by the Nibelungs um, uh, themselves. In any case uh, as we were saying the serpent corrodes the roots of the divine tree Yggdrasil and the collapse of the tree will mark the twilight of the race of the gods. In other words this actonic subterranean and Pelasgian power embodies the, the power of decadence and, um, and the struggle is quite even. If you look at Germanic archaeology you see I don't know that they, the Germans settling in the in the post-Roman lands came from this, you know, comparing their, their art to the one of the locals, eventually, they would eventually take over of them also, but this originally, right, the first generations had this display of cosmic serpents devouring 
humans and have it representing all of this just scattering the limbs everywhere so this represented the the constant tension and and tragic and violent mindset that 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 around which everything the, the world revolved right and albeit Siegfried as we've seen is killed in the end by treachery um, and the gold is returned to the waters um, the hero remains uh, the heroic type endowed with the Tarn cap that is uh, this coat that has uh, it, it's also a symbolic power in the same way so eventually I don't know if you read the Nibelungen and all, uh, all these things that you you realize that they of course uh, everything is also embellished in a literary sense but it's always a symbolic concept uh, of uh, power that can transfer a person from the bodily dimension to an invisible one that's in fact also how Siegfried, Siegfried through treachery, because the Tarn Kappa is created by, by the same Nibelungs in, in the story, um, manages to defeat and actually possess Brunhild, right? That story eventually is married by Gunther because she was uh, challenged to, to do, etc. But that's actually the uh, chivalric romanticized version of something very different. Um, as uh, Siegfried, Siegfried was the uh, as as a hero predestined to possess the divine woman, the heavenly maid uh, that Brynhild represented. In part, this could be seen as as a vanquished um, Amazonian queen. So, uh, the symbol of the uh, gynocratic uh, uh, communities that inhabited the land before the Indo-European migration that had to be conquered and, and raped and also because of the of course of creating like the the rape of the Sabines with Romulus etc it's the same story right you know, properly these were the the most powerful in charge and they had to be tamed in order to breed new uh, generation of heroes but also this persists in the religion as as we've seen the possession of your own inner female demon uh, that eventually transformed itself into the Valkyrie um, in uh, in battle, in the moment of greatest danger, where, where you, you, you have to tame those darkest instincts so that they can turn into the golden heavenly ones. So Brynhild is the symbol of this, as the queen of the Northern Island as well, also in the form of a Valkyrie herself, a warrior virgin who went from an earthly to a divine seat. And never mistake also the the later sagas adaptations to to you know an idea of kind of female uh, you know power uh, you know feministic but actually very very often uh, manipulated eventually ethnocentristic to say the least um, were not white supremacist way when in the by the the, the people were allegedly kind of uh, bringing this uh, cultures on the foreback who don't understand anything. Here the female element is archetypal and it means specifically that that feminine element within um, ourselves and within the community that has to be brought under control, right, and elevated itself in the heavenly uh, in the best heavenly nature. Also because the warrior this this um, this virgin is the heavenly maiden is exactly also the reward in the Indo-European heaven, right, for those who fall in, into battle during the, the Holy War, right. Uh, Islam took this thing straight from the uh, the Iranian uh, Indo-European religion, which said exactly the same thing, so it's also something provocative to think in this regard. Now, um, as for the origins of the uh, of the people in the Norse uh, mythology. Well, uh, Gardariki, a land located I in a far north, so where the, the center of the world and also property of the light um, uh, would, have, would have been, uh, was the, the original homeland. Uh, this is present, as we've seen, only in the European religion. And this seat uh, has been dif differently identified, even here uh, there are different traditions because of the, the same dispersion of these these ideas and their gradual secularization even within the pagan world so much that 
uh, if you Google that, Gerderik is mostly identified in the Kievan Rus itself, right, in the north of the Kievan Rus. But uh, this was also identified actually with the Scandinavian region itself and associated with each of the polar function of Midgard, that was the world of man and uh, properly also the primordial center where everything had stemmed from. Um, in fact, um, there is here a transposition of memories from the physical to the metaphysical dimension, as Gardariki was also identified with the Asgard itself. So it was a bit like, um, you know, Delphi for for the Greeks, right? The Apollo, the, the idea of the the maximum uh, of the, the divinity of light, uh, also had put its center geographically. This is present in many other. But also the Olympus, of course. I mean, any symbol that regarded the, the, the all the common origins about the, the mountain in the far north were, you know, uh, surrounded by ice and pure light that uh, where, there is where the, the, the gods lived, literally. Now, uh, the Asgard, as we've seen, was allegedly the dwelling place of the non-human ancestors, in fact, of the noble Norse families. And, and thus the, the idea of nobility stemmed from in a world that was actually not socially stratified at all compared to the other, probably the least stratified all the Indo-European world at the time where the time you're studying and that uh, was in fact problematic because uh, being a nobleman was you know much uh, conferred you actually much less power than in other places so you had to really fight for it so that's why also this radically individualistic, militaristic ethos uh, attached in those populations. Because they had to demonstrate it constantly. And uh, in Asgard, the Scandinavian sacred kings, such as Gilfer, had gone to proclaim their power. So this stressed how divine the nobility was. As we've seen, no man could actually go in the Asgard um, if it was not already a hero, in fact, of a nobleman. And the two things basically overlapped, right? But we, if we distinguish them, it's because, you know, we also have developed a later on a different concept of nobility. But the idea is that everybody in theory could be, a, every human can be a hero and hence a nobleman at the same time. Uh, then here there is probably a eugenetic view, meaning that the nobility was a stock that also biologically descended from the he uh, from from the gods, but still there was the possibility of elevating, transfiguring yourself in that fashion. Actually, this was more likely if you were a nobleman, and so this nobility was also, as we've seen, a matter of wisdom, right? Of uh, of um, of power that could and would would hopefully not even be needed to to be unleashed because. Uh, the Friede is the ideal of peace in arms among the Germanic peoples, which means, you know, by deterrence, if I'm powerful enough and a good ruler, first of all, I don't need to fight because I'm already the best fundamentally and everybody obeys. Um, so hence the concept of Germanic kingship and nobility stemming from. Um, and... Um, and Gilfer had received in the Asgard the traditional teaching of the Edda, allegedly, according to some tradition. So that this, this knowledge would properly be treasured by the nobility and that would understand this in a functional sense about what the world was concretely about in order to rule, because it stemmed from the same gods who ruled the entire world. Um, and needless to say, Asgard was also a sacred land the uh, land of the Asen, the Nordic Olympian gods, and no uh, giant could set foot there. No titanic element. It was, you know, those are below. Mm -hmm. So, all these elements are, we could expand it, we'll make other videos actually on this, but, you know, th they are the traditional legacy of the North Germanic populations, right? Um, as a view of the world, the uh, the outcome of the decline, the Ragnarokr, was naturally I associated with ideals uh, and with figurations of gods were typical of the heroic cycles. Um, and 
it's a subtle legacy because again it's uh, much but if, if anything also the sources are you know they they wouldn't write until christianization so it's not we can't claim too much but let's say even in their in their legacy as far as we we can see it and actually limpidly right the, actually the christianization is not even a problem you can easily read behind that so even though this issue oh no that's not the true thing well it actually is right you know if you especially if you if you know anything about which in fact most people who, who say these things absolutely don't know anything about indo-european religions you can easily spot that um but uh also the same germanic world had this uh drift that began to be to become a bit more kind of as it had happened in the Atlantic in the Roman civilization it had began to tell the story kind of a more secularized way towards the end not quite meaning that it, it was secular in meaning to them but I mean secularization literally for example even in the style in the narrative right everything was also kind of more enriched embellished and said the Indo-European principle was as you know was essentially a geometric pure concise immediate uh so so too many stories actually mean uh too much bullshit you know, in the process right as long as it flourishes it's, it's over it's hypertrophic and it doesn't get to the point it becomes a distraction rather um and so this can be observed in fact in other cultures the same before but indeed um the myth and the saga uh show this universal idea uh, and especially as we've seen the one of the Asgard, Midgard, the center of the world that again is basically the overlaps with the entire thing from the Veda to the, to, to the Romans uh, and you know from the Persians to the to the Greeks and so on and on and on. All right for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.